Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have with us Philip Strauch, a physiotherapist, a researcher and an educator and the man behind our shoulder course sat as well. Now before we dive in I wanted to quickly mention this episode of the podcast is sponsored by our friends over at Kinvent, a company dedicated to helping you measure and track your client's progress, giving you objective data on which you can use to pinpoint areas for improvement to better program your patient recovery. There'll be a little bit more on them later in the podcast. Philip, I've given a really small little bite-sized bit about yourself. Why don't you take a couple of minutes, give us a little background on who you are and what it is you do, and then we can take our first dip into the world of the uh, uh, shoulder complex here on the podcast. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Anis. Also, thanks for uh, inviting me here on the, on the podcast. Uh, uh, it's always nice to spread the uh, shoulder word in the shoulder world. Huh? Thanks for the intro and for uh, inviting me. Shoulders are my uh, my job. It's my my hobby, my interest. I even have shoulder pain myself now. So anyway, it's a big part of my life now. Just short, I'm, I'm, I did my master's in physiotherapy in around 2000, something like that. And I did another master in sports physiotherapy uh, in Belgium. And then uh, combined that always with clinical work. So that's uh, from from the moment I graduated until now, I kept on doing uh, clinical work together with the uh, educations. And then after a while, I did I started as a researcher in uh, the University of Antwerp. I did my PhD there on the role of the scapula and in shoulder pain patients more specifically. And I always kept that combination of clinical work and academic work at the University of Antwerp in, uh, in Belgium. Now, yeah, finally, I'm, um, I'm a full-time professor now, Rehabilitation Sciences and Physiotherapy uh, in University of Antwerp. And I still combine that with my uh, clinical work. Although the clinic, I'm just seeing uh, shoulder patients now varying from top athletes to complex chronic shoulder pain to elderly after shoulder arthroplasty. So it's uh, the whole range of shoulder problems uh, we uh, we see. And it's just about a half a day per week. So it's not that much anymore. It's just to keep the foot into the clinic when uh, teaching and uh, researching uh, uh, on shoulders. So uh, I think that's a good balance. Yeah, however, I, I do have a life besides <laughs> shoulders. I have a wife and two beautiful daughters that and a white important. shepherd. I uh, told you yeah. about white shepherd. And uh, well, I love, I also love swimming, walking, uh, mountain biking. So that's a bit my, uh, my, my part for the dating site. Uh, uh, <laughs> here <laughs> in not the, let the, the podcast. That bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, fantastic. I think that's really important as well with the guests that we have on that you, you see that combination of not just being a researcher or an educator, but also still in clinic, in practice, mm -hmm. as it like you say you keep your foot in that you keep your your, mm. your toes a little wet you be, you be wet with it it just keeps you as up to date as your research is on how things really mm. are in the clinic because sometimes not exactly. everything is applicable and it, it lets you know straight away exactly but yeah before we get diving deep into the shoulder can you give us a little bit about what's involved in an assessment and diagnosis about a mm. shoulder because it, it's quite complex even even now when I get in shoulder patients and I've worked with baseball I've worked with some of the guys that play for the Dutch national team mm. in baseball as well but even then the shoulder still has me scratching my head give me a knee a hip or an ankle and I'm there and the shoulder I'm st I still have to take a moment to really think hard about what's going on so mm. what goes into that for you yeah, 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 it's it's a it's a complex joint, and not only a complex joint, it's also a complex patients. Often, it's not only about the joint. So maybe that's my first thing I would uh, like to highlight here is that when looking at the shoulder, we may never forget that good shoulder function depends on both the shoulder and the brain. There was this study a few years ago published in Nature that looked into the evolution of shoulder biomechanics through history. And they stated that we developed some so, sort of specific shoulder kinematics just to be able to hunt on animals, to, to feed ourselves on animals. And they even suggested that the whole reason why we as, as humans are so dominantly present here on Earth is due to the evolvement of our shoulders, giving us the ability to hunt and to survive. Uh, so that was quite a, a strong statement there in this article. It's a great study, by the way. Anyway, you, you can imagine that the brain scientists got a bit angry there and uh, said, well, it's not only about the shoulder. And they countered them by stating that pain comes from the brain. The shoulder kinematics depend on, on motor programs uh, in our motor, motor cortex. So it's all depending on the brain. It gave rise to a, a beautiful but maybe 
if I can use the word stupid discussion, which of both are the most important. So uh, you, can get, you can guess where the discussion ended, but both are uh, needed for proper shoulder function. Absolutely. And I think that, that that's really an important, important thing we, we, we sometimes tend to forget. So if you ask me what, what is important in shoulder assessment, then this will be my first and main advice. A shoulder needs both anatomy, biomechanics, and a well-functioning uh, brain. So, and this is relevant in each patient. So some might seem a bit more biomechanical problems and others more brainy uh, problems, but it's always important in each um, patient. If you focus on the shoulder more specifically, then of course the shoulder is more than a glenohumeral uh, issue. Uh, it's a glenohumeral joint, but it's the scapular thoracic also. Uh, uh, the scapula in relation to the humerus uh, has uh, been subject to many studies uh, the last decades. And then also the acromioclavicular. I have the impression that this is a joint that's also very important that we tend to forget or we tend to put the acromioclavicular joint in some sort of, it's only traumatic corner. While it's definitely is not, eh, there are really a lot of atraumatic chronic uh, AC problems that look like rotator cuff related problems, but there aren't. So there is a big thing here with the acromioclavicular joint sternoclavicular neck, thorax, elbow, etc. And I say it uh, quite fast, but they're also uh, important in the whole picture uh, of the patient. And, and we can use that in our diagnosis, in our assessment. We can use the whole uh, movement pattern to see, okay, is this a tenderness problem? Is this a capsular problem? What is really going on? And uh, in my opinion, one of the most exciting things is searching for the patterns and, and especially searching what you can use in your rehabilitation strategy to get the patient better. I think even more important than trying to find the, the exact structure that's maybe damaged. So I'm, for instance, not bothered whether the supraspinators or the infraspinators is, is, uh, has a tendinopathy. That's actually not so much, I, I don't bother, but I would like to know it's a tendinous problem or a capsular problem, for instance, or an articular problem. That's important. But for your rehabilitation, it's, uh, it's more important to know what, what type of structure it's, uh, is important rather than the exact structure, I think. And, uh, and then you've got other tools in which you can use in your assessment, like symptom modification uh, tools, if you like, uh, but also just a trial and error with an intervention with loading of structures. And this all fits within the assessment to get the right dose uh, of your intervention uh, there and uh, well, that's my main uh, thing I, th I would like to emphasize here. It's, uh, it's about the brain. It's about the shoulder. And if you look at the shoulder, don't forget it's more than a glenohumeral joint. And uh, we tend to forget that. But in your good visual observation, you, you need to assess capital thoracic, for instance, very well to check whether there are any compensations uh, in relation to the glenohumeral joint, for instance. So this is like that basic part of the assessment that you taught in school of when someone's going through the, the painful arc. For example, watching the scapular thoracic movement there. What is it that we're looking for there? How important is scapular movement? How much can we do for scapular movement if you get somebody in? Scapular movement and scapular dyskinesis is, has been the topic of my PhD. I did in, I think, between 2005 and 2010, something like that. It was, at that time, I, I remember I, I, I had a good uh, supervisor and I asked my supervisor, what topic can you guide me? Uh, and he said, okay, I'm, I'm a specialist in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and I'm also uh, starting my research in scapular dyskinesis. So it's up to you. And at that time, I think it was 2004 or something, I was thinking, oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to do fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome uh, research because imagine after five or six years of PhD, they start discussing the relevance of it. I couldn't believe that would be possible. So I chose scapular dyskinesis. Now 2020 and uh, 2021, sorry. Yeah. And they're uh, discussing the relevance of scapular dyskinesis. So it's, it's a bizarre turn <laughs> that the whole thing has, has made. It's um, the other way. Yeah, it's really the other way. And, and, and while well, chronic fatigue syndrome and, and fibromyalgia are still a, a, a thing, well, scapular dyskinesis is now under debate. So that's, yeah, that what's happened. I'm confident that scapular thoracic joints or physiological joint is important in the well-functioning of the shoulder. That's really think, something that's uh, important. And we cannot confuse that with the fact whether or not scapular dyskinesis is predictive for shoulder pain or not, for instance, because that's another sort of discussion. It's important for shoulder functioning, but 
if we see something different on a, on a scapula, if we see scapular dyskinesis or tilting of the scapula, or winging of the scapula, then we tend to think that this is whole, the whole reason why someone has shoulder pain. And we, we did for a long time. Uh, we did a lot of studies in, in case control studies, and we saw that these patients with shoulder pain had scapular dyskinesis, and the, and the subjects without shoulder pain had less scapular dyskinesis. I'm not saying none, but less. Yeah. And then we, okay, so the, so scapular dyskinesis was whole, the whole thing, the whole cause and basis of, of shoulder pain. But after a few years, and actually, especially after a, a few good, strong longitudinal trials in which we uh, followed healthy uh, athletes, healthy subjects with scapular dyskinesis, we saw that, well, after a few years, they did not develop shoulder pain, not more than someone who didn't have scapular dyskinesis. So actually, from the last evidence we have in the last five, six years, we see that this whole scapular dyskinesis isn't maybe the one that's predictive for shoulder pain. And maybe it's the other way around, that the shoulder pain itself has an effect on the, the somatosensory cortex and has an interaction with our motor cortex. And maybe that's the reason why, first of all, the scapulothoracic muscles have different uh, activity. But also, uh, maybe this, this whole scapulothoracic joint tries to help the cuff to get the, the, the shoulder where the patient wants his shoulder to be. So maybe the patient that has problems with his cuff has extra help from the scapula to get there. And then we see scapular dyskinesis and we think that's the whole reason for the pain. But well, that, it can easily be the other way around. So we, we also see that in, uh, as you just said, the painful arc, uh, which is uh, often thought, okay, you've got a painful arc. That's because of there is a reduced supracromial space between uh, 60 and 120 degrees of abduction. And that's the reason for a painful arc. That's also something that is under discussion now, in which we think, well, maybe maybe that's not the case. And uh, maybe it's not the, the supracromial space that's reduced in this uh, 60 between 120 degrees, but maybe the, this position has the highest load on the cuff eh? because the arm is actually almost at, when it comes at 90 degrees, it has the, the highest load on the cuff. So maybe that's the reason why the patient has the most pain in that position rather than in uh, an extreme position, extreme, extreme abduction or in uh, just uh, relaxed position. So where a lot of uh, explanations we had in the past are now under debate and we start to rethink them and we start to have, a, I have the feeling of some, some sort of more common sense, more logical look on the movement of the shoulder. And, and we said, okay, no, uh, it's not that simplistic. It's not just uh, the scapula that develops shoulder pain. It can be the other way around. It's not the painful arc. That's not because of the supracromial space. It's not because of that region that maybe is reduced or not. No, no, it can just be the load on the cuff. And we, 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 we are re rethinking some of these rationales now. And uh, I think we're, we're making more sense than we did 10 or 20 years ago, a lot more sense. And uh, we see that also in, in rehabilitation. We, we, we have a more stronger rationale for exercise therapy rather than 20 years ago, in which pain was from the supracromial space. And now we, we know it, it might be just an intrinsic tendon uh, related uh, thing. Okay, great. Yeah. So that's a little bit about the scapula. Now, yeah. can you talk us through what your assessment strategy would be when you get somebody in i think you've mentioned a couple of things there biomechanics you've mentioned the uh joints or you've mentioned looking at whether it's a tendon or an articulate uh, the articulation or the capsule what's your strategy in going about evaluating and eliminating all these different things or ruling mm. in or ruling out so to speak mm. Mm. yeah um well uh, to, to follow up on my previous talk about scapula, it's also in this this part of the discussion that are, there has been some changes. Eh? And we we be focused a lot on special tests over a, a decade ago or longer, even ex actually from 1970s when the whole uh, supracromial space decom uh, compression theory was there. Then we developed a lot of special tests and uh, uh, we thought that was the, the golden bullet. We now know that actually these... Uh, Special tests aren't so special, uh, and they're they're maybe not the thing you should use in uh, in your clinical reasoning. I believe it's not easy to let go of the special test concept. I, I agree that it's that's not that easy, and maybe that's because that would mean that we need to reason more. We need to think more. If you let go of the special test, we need to use our own clinical reasoning more. And also the uncertainty rises again. And that's not something we, we, we like as a clinician or as a person at all. It's not something we like, and it's a, but it's a normal reaction. And, but as you say, it, it doesn't always make 
uh, sense anymore to rely on uh, on specific tests. Uh, it, it can be an interesting way to provoke typical pain in your clinic. Uh, for instance, if you want to use this test in combination with symptom modification procedure, or if you want to score pain or do an evaluation over a period of time. But using them as a gold standard for your diagnosis appears to be uh, tricky, especially if you want to use pain as the outcome measure. Pain is, is we know that in the in chronic pain population, it's not the most reliable outcome. So it's extra tricky. And we see that the diagnostic value of tests that doesn't use pain as an outcome such as the apprehension in shoulder apprehension relocation release tests, well, they, they're significantly better than, than when we use pain as an outcome measure. So that's the first thing. And then, of course, these tests have, have been developed to find, to track supracromial de- uh, compression. We now know that maybe this whole compression theory doesn't make sense anymore. So what are you searching with these tests? Uh, what are you looking for? Uh, if you want to find compression, you use some special tests for that, but compression is not the issue anymore. Then you're actually searching for something that's not there. And then, yeah, of course, then the validity of your test is, uh, is gone. So that's actually something we, we, we took a swing away from the special tests now, and we're looking at, okay, which structure is, uh, is damaged now. When we look at the patient, we go for a screening for a history taking of the patient to make some sort of profile of the patient. And, and we know then, okay, maybe this, for instance, is a more tenderness problem. We want to rule out uh, cervical issues. We rule out uh, articular or capsular issues like frozen shoulder. We rule out uh, trauma, of course, and, and uh, dislocations or glenormal instability. And then we actually know, okay, if we rule, if we rule out all these uh, more articular capsular things and, uh, and there was no trauma and it's not a cervical thing, well, the likelihood of being a, a, a tendinous, a rotator cuff tendinous problem, is, it gets very high, of course. Then you can use provocative tests just to provoke the typical pain. And then you use your interventions, but maybe on this way of eliminating some of the other diagnosis makes your likelihood of a rotator cuff related shoulder problem much, uh, much higher. And we start to think in terms of probability of likelihood rather than you do that test. Okay. He or she has pain. It's a cuff problem. We've left that part. If your special tests are coming further towards the end of that assessment, then what are you starting it off with? What is your basis for your clinical reasoning? Now you mentioned there your patient history, you mentioned the obvious things like a trauma, you know, if someone falls and they fall, dislocate their arm or they have a fall and they sprain their AC joint. I know you said, don't think of AC as just a traumatic issue, but just for, for argument's sake, for example, how, how are you then going to systematically go through it? Are you looking at range of motion? Are you looking at functional movement? Are you looking at the, what you mentioned earlier with the brain connection to the shoulder? Are you looking at the movement in the kinetic chain, how everything's working together? How would you structure that? It's a good question, but it's not, not so easily answered actually, but when you got your patient, each um, way you, you go through clinical reasoning, changes a bit depending on which patient you have uh, for you. So I don't think there is this, this gold standard way of looking at each patient the same way. Uh, that's, that's difficult, I think. But I go for a search on which type of structures are mainly giving the patient complaints, such as tenderness, articular capsular. So I don't so much bother the exact anatomical structure. So whether it's a supraspinatus or an infraspinatus, I don't really care. It sounds a bit bizarre maybe, but... I see that my rehab strategy doesn't need the info to be successful. So my rehab strategy doesn't need the info. Is it a supraspinatus or an infraspinatus? If you track the, the patients and you just let the patient move and let the patient tell you which movements hurt and, and, and explain when they hurt, what reduces the pain, what increases the pain, gives you a good picture, a good idea of what direction your rehabilitation strategy should go to, uh, towards. So for instance, very, a very clear example, if you're certain, okay, this is a, a tendinous problem. This is, for instance, a, a, an office worker who has uh, done uh, too much gardening and uh, he tells you he has uh, a shoulder pain uh, since he uh, worked in his garden. 
and it tells you, okay, I have, I have some pain at night and, 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 and I just wake up sometimes at night when I lay on the shoulder and, and in the day when I move my arm, when I try to take something in the kitchen or whatever, it hurts. And you have excluded these other factors like a trauma, a cervical, a frozen shoulder, etc. And you know, there are no very relevant red flags in, in this patient. Well, then actually then you can can, can just check which direction the patient has his uh, most uh, pain. So if he tells you, oh, in anteflexion, anteflexion, forward flexion, I don't have any problems. But if I go in a scapular uh, plane direction, then really that's my, my that's my typical pain. Around 90 degrees, my pain uh, starts until 120 degrees. That's the most uh, painful area. Well, then actually your patient has just told you which direction your ex exercise should go through. So I don't need a, an EMG, for instance, to tell me which exercise I should give my patient. My patient just told me if I do end the forward flexion, then I'm not loading my injured tissue. So then you can question yourself, what's the, the whole idea of doing a lot of forward flexion exercises? It's okay if you want to do that, but it will not target the injured structures. But if he tells you, okay, it's in the scapular plane that my shoulder hurts, then you know, okay, in that direction targets the injured or damaged tissues. I don't know whether it's the supraspinatus or an infraspinatus. I still don't know, or maybe even the biceps. I don't know. But if I do that, if I do exercises in that direction, and of course, maybe I just downsize them and make a, a shorter lever, leverage or, or whatever, um, or in a, in a different position, I just downsize them for a while and then start to rebuild from there. But actually, I know which direction I should train with him, in which direction I should, should load uh, his shoulders. But still, you have to let go of the fact that you're not 100% sure which tissue is the most damaged here. You don't know. You don't know that. And well... You need to accept that, I think, and that's a, it's maybe a difficult step, but I, I, I see that you don't need to know that. And if you have a good training program with your patient and you do a really good follow-up, make the patient really motivated, compliant with exercises, and you can focus on that, well, you, you can put all your energy on that, then you have the best, way, the best chances of getting a good outcome in these, uh, in these patients. And whether it was a supraspinatus or infa, yeah, sorry. Don't know. You, you can even have an, an, an ultrasound in which shows that the, that the supraspinatus is the more damaged and the infraspinatus is not, but still the pain can come from the infra and not from the supra. So, well, that, that's for me enough to say, okay, I, I don't need to know it. And I can use the functional testing and just the analytic testing and functional testing to show me what, what way I should uh, go with the, uh, with the exercises. So that all but eliminates the, I suppose, the reliance and the need on that special testing so why do you think it is that we're still taught it in our universities so you're a professor you're teaching at the moment is it part of your curriculum for special testing or have you you know coaxed the university to start moving the special testing at least for the shoulder yeah. stuff out a little bit or what do you think yeah. is the reason that we're still so focused on it because it was drilled into us we got the uh, yeah. the whole formula of impingement or what so have you internal external or all, all the rest of it for the for the shoulder complex mm. and it was yeah. heavily drilled in what what do you think is yeah. the rationale behind still giving the old hat to the new new school yeah well i can understand that for students it's uh, it's it's much easier to rely on a test and the test says yes or no and then you can, like in a flow chart, you can go towards a diagnosis. It's, it's much easier than, than telling them, okay, it's about clinical reasoning and just about thinking how the patient moves and what the patient needs. It's, it's, it appears to be some scary than, uh, than just using a simple, simple specific test, uh, in which it says yes or no, and then follow your flow chart. So I think that's partially the reason we uh, taught the special tests for a long time in the curriculum. And then uh, I think about five or six years ago, we explained to the, to the students that these special tests weren't that special. But, well, we weren't the only ones who teach to the students. Uh, so there were also orthopedic surgeons and there were also other uh, teachers in which they still had the special tests. So the, the students got confused a lot. And we saw that there needs to be a, if in, for an education, you need to be on the same line uh, with all the other teachers, also from the, the ones who give practical classes and the ones who give lecturing and etc. So you need to be on, on one line. We, we see that it takes a little bit of time 
to get everyone on the same line. But now I think we're there and we only mention them anymore. So we mention special tests so that they are aware of them, that they know how they are performed without the fact that like in their masters, they don't, don't need to perform them anymore. But they need to know what, what's happening there. What, what is a clinical sp specific test? What is a special test? What is a near test, a Hawkins, an empty cam? What's, what's that? Because sometimes they will uh, reach reports or they will be uh, uh, asked uh, from another clinician who tell them that they were positive on some special test. So it's, it's good to know about that, but we still train them to be cr uh, critical and to uh, be aware that the clinometric properties are not that good for these tests and you need to rely on your clinical reasoning and sometimes use a, a way of exclusion diagnosis to get there. And we teach them, but still, I, I must admit, we uh, also still teach them and tell them which tests are there and how they're performed because they still need to, to have that knowledge, I think. Also, that's maybe an extra thing. We, uh, we, we sometimes use these tests as a standardized way to provoke typical pain. And in that way, it might be interesting. And it might be interesting to use that test as a pain score and then use it as an evaluation after a, a few sessions. Or you can use them in combination with symptom modification tests in which you adjust, for, for instance, capillary movement and see whether it has effects pain on an empty can test or not and it gives, can give you some extra information on where to go from there so it, it's not all uh, bad about these special tests but we need to use them in the right way and not in the way we do a test and then if it's yes you got rheumatoid arthritis shoulder pain if it's not painful you, you don't got it so i think that's uh, that's too primitive and that's uh, something we need to let go yeah yeah okay fantastic that's quite a thorough answer there as to uh, yeah the reasoning the rationale behind still having to keep them just to be able to play ball with all our other partners in crime and healthcare and making sure that we're critical enough to evaluate mm. what's relevant, what's not. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Fair. So just stick into the assessment bit before we move on a little further. What key indicators would you say for someone to look out for to separate between tendon articulating uh, structures or capsula? What are the key elements that someone should look out for in, in their history taking or in their physical assessment? Well, if a patient has tenderness problems like rotator cuff related uh, shoulder pain, this, then it's, um, it, the, the way the patient explains their shoulder pain should be in some way load related. Uh, it should be load related. To, for instance, if you do passive testing, most of the uh, rotator cuff related shoulder pain patients are not reporting that much problems with passive movements. Sometimes with stretching of, 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 of part of the cuff, then you can have some provocation, but mostly they don't, uh, they don't have problems with that. So it's, it's mostly load related. If you give them one kilogram and you let them move and you give them five kilograms, well, the five should hurt more than one, for instance, but it's maybe a simplistic example, but it, it's load related and, and the frozen shoulder patient, if you give them one kilogram or five, well, that doesn't really matter. It will hurt anyway, <laughs> in, 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 even passively. So that's a big difference. It, it, it needs to be load related in, in tenderness, uh, tenderness issues. If you look at more like frozen shoulders or uh, arthrosis or osteoarthritis patients, there is a different profile of the patient also, I think. So for instance, the, the frozen shoulder patients, they, uh, they tend to have a specific age. Uh, first of all, uh, so they're around their 50s, uh, which is not the case for tenderness problems. They can be 50, of course, but they can also be 30 or 40 or whatever. Uh, but uh, the, the frozen shoulders, they tend to be around 50. They tend to, uh, they tend to be women <laughs> also, about 70% are women. They tend to have comorbidities like diabetes, uh, thyroid problems. They tend to have all these whole clusters. Is, is, is this profile is a bit different. It's, it's also often on the non-dominant side, while rotator cuff related problems are, are mostly on the dominant side. While the frozen shoulder can easily be on the non-dominant side. And well, that it gives you a, 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 like this bizarre feeling inside from, okay, this is not only a tenderness, a, a tenderness issue. Hmm. Although a lot of patients I see in the clinic that are frozen shoulders are actually actually first got in the practice as a rotator cuff related problem and uh, because they just had pain. They had pain and they had pain with movements and they were given this the stamp to diagnosis your rotator cuff related problem. But then you see uh, in the patient's profile that they um, or in the patient's reaction on, on intervention for instance on, on therapy on 
uh, on exercises, they, they don't don't react well on exercises. Uh, frozen shoulders, they don't tend to react well on increasing the load of your exercises. While if you give a rotator cuff related patient and some exercises, then um, very often uh, just by moving their shoulders with a weight, the, the pain is reduced after a while. They get this uh, um, uh, hypoalgesia by, induced by exercise, which is not the case in, in uh, capsular issues. Then they just get more pain and they tell you a few days later that they it, it hurt like hell, your exercises, and, and it's right. not getting better at all. And they, and they tend to reduce their uh, range of motion, etc. So that's one of the first uh, things you see in these rotated cuff related patients that are probably not rotated cuff related patients but frozen shoulders and then you have to switch a little bit to a therapeutic intervention that's not that's more focused on the tissue irritability of the patient in this frozen shoulder patient so yeah it's uh, it's it's based on load i think that's an important one for tenderness problems the passive restrictions that are uh, for instance in frozen shoulder patients are uh, can be capsular together with the cuff and are for instance if patient moves towards abduction and you ask an external rotation together with abduction, then you will see that in the, in the neutral position, their external rotation will be bigger, will be larger than in 90 degrees of abduction. So the uh, external rotation will be reduced if you have extra abduction. That's typical for, for uh, capsular issues. While in a tenderness problem, uh, often patients have maybe some reduction in external rotation, but if you go to the 90 degrees of elevation, then suddenly their external rotation increases. So and that's not typical for frozen shoulders. So in that way, you can also distinguish uh, more capsular is issues from uh, tenderness uh, problems. But a few examples which you can use. So it's a little search, but that's the exciting job, I think. Uh, we're not using one simple special test, but it's just a bit of a search in which you try to unravel the, um, the pain problem. But I, most of the cases, it's, it's, it's possible to distinguish them. What? are the most common pathologies that you would see then or mechanisms of injuries that you'd see coming into clinic? Because you mentioned you see quite a wide variety of patients from your pro athlete all the way to Joe Bloggs on the roads and he's got a chronic issue. Yeah, well, both in um, in the clinic and in research, as, uh, I think the rotator cuff related problems are the most uh, most seen. They're the, the largest group, uh, although they're not always the same, they're really not the same problems, but they're, they're a big group, of course, in which you sometimes have uh, like athletes who have uh, long head biceps uh, at, uh, tenderness um, uh, problems. Uh, but then also I exist 45 year old uh, office worker who has uh, supra or infraspinatus uh, tenderness uh, problems, in which often the, the, the overload is the issue or actually, and I, I, I like the way, um, Attendant specialists now like to refer to it as it's not it's maybe not the overload but it's the underload to the years before. <laughs> it's it, it it comes to the same uh, conclusion, but it's it's a, a good way to see it. They often they often done very few with their shoulders and then they, they do something with their shoulders and they have a, a tenderness overload. So they're the biggest group, I think, but also many frozen shoulders also see a little bit more frozen shoulder than usual. Uh, uh, maybe it's the COVID area now, the COVID period that's giving more frozen shoulders. I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't the, do a, a study on, on the, that relationship yet, but I see a lot of frozen shoulders and sometimes, um, Coming in the clinic as two separate diagnoses, like you got a frozen shoulder or you got rotator cuff related shoulder pain, but also, as I said previously, sometimes a rotator cuff related shoulder pain patient comes in the clinic but goes out with a frozen shoulder. And not that we create frozen shoulders, I hope, but but the pathology looked like a rotator cuff related problem, but after a while it gets clear that's more frozen shoulder type pain. So these two together are the the biggest group. But besides these group, I, um, I often get complex chronic uh, shoulder pain problems in which they have more than only shoulder pain. These are often younger, tend to be more women than men. Younger women who have also have a busy, a busy life besides their work. They have a busy uh, family life or whatever. But I, see, I often see these complex patients in which we, we tend to think about central sensitization in these, uh, in these patients. And then what we'll see is we see also post-trauma. Patients, uh, shoulder arthroplasties, uh, instability, all, all, all the rest. But the major groups, frozen shoulder and uh, rotator cuff related uh, shoulder pain uh, uh, by far. 
Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. I just wanted to take a little break there to talk to you about our sponsor, Kimbed. I've been using one of their devices, the Muscle Controller, a handheld dynamometer, in my practice for the last while now. And it's been a bit of a game changer for me, as it's easy to set up on your mobile to help you track and trace individual patients and monitor their progress, as well as identifying areas that they may need a little extra attention on. The app itself is really intuitive and can help with patient motivation. I'll leave that bit for you to discover yourself, as well as providing mini quote unquote games that you can use for your patients and mini protocols in there for your assessments. There's a reason why they've been adopted by professional sports clubs and universities around the world. They have a range of different products to aid in your assessment and evaluation for your patients, and you can check them all out over at k-invent.com. That's k-invent.com and have a look. And if you do, Use the code PhysioTutors5 at checkout for 5% off. On top of that, I wanted to quickly mention Philip's online course that he's done with us, Rotator Cuff Related Shoulder Pain, Separating Fat from Fiction. There, Philip goes in depth on the latest shoulder research and rehabilitation, what is and isn't useful anymore. As we mentioned in the podcast, why special tests might not be so special, and exercises and little gems that you can take straight into your own practice on Monday morning. As listeners of the podcast, you'll get a discount code rcrsp50 for 50 euros off that's rcrsp50 so rotator cuff related shoulder pain 50 that's enough from me back to the podcast stepping forward a little bit what is your approach to the initial stages of rehabilitation you mentioned earlier about using weight for for patients how do you gauge what you're going to start with in terms of the the load be it weight be it theraband or what have you and then my next question on top of that is then going to be about how you progress but yeah let's start from the start and talk about how how you get cracking with the patient yeah yeah that's an important one that's a good one and that's uh because of, yeah i i i previously talked about exercise about load but actually that's not that's not the first step but i'll i'll, I'll take the example of a rotator cuff related shoulder pain patients uh, for now in case of this uh, rotator cuff related shoulder pain, I start with explaining what's going on. I answer questions, questions they ask, but even if they don't ask it, I answer the questions they don't ask also. What is going on in my shoulder? Uh, what, what's, what's happening? They want to know what's, what's the reason for my pain. It's the first important question you can address and explain about the tendons that need to control the, the humeral head a bit and that can be overloaded and they can give rise to pain. So you give an explanation of, about their problem and you get an explanation where, where does it all come from? And maybe you can, uh, in most cases, you can find some, some sort of reason like uh, they did too much uh, uh, painting uh, in their house uh, and they're not used to it or they just uh, went to the fitness and they're not used to it or they uh, were our at- athletes, but due to COVID, they did uh, nothing for two months and then restarted at the same level. And then you can explain why they have overloaded their tendons, their structure. So, and then you can explain why they are, uh, if, if they want to get to the same level and they restart at the same level as two months before, yeah, why they have overloaded their, uh, their structures. So that's the way, where does it all come from? But then I also try to answer the question, how long would it take? Um, some patients will ask you, but a lot of them won't. And uh, they, but they think about that. But how long will I be here in the clinic? How long do I have to train before my shoulder pain is gone? And then I think that's an important question. And then a question that um, we address mostly as, okay, if, if you have rotator cuff related pain and, and we, we go for the, for the exercises, it's usually at least three months that you need your exercises to do your exercise to get a significant uh, result. And even after three months, it's, it, it might not be completely gone. So they need to, to know some, some sort of time frame. They need to know that it's not going to be gone in a week. Uh, they also need to know that it's not about two, three years uh, of suffering. No, we know from research about 12 weeks, th- three months in order to get a clinical re- relevant effect. But it's important they know that because if they don't know that and, and they just start training and, and after a few weeks, uh, they uh, have the feeling it's not better. Yeah, and they didn't know that it was going to take 12 weeks of exercise. Well, they might think, oh, I'm, I'm not getting better after two weeks. I need a second opinion and I need to go somewhere else who, who gives me a good massage of my, my shoulder. And yeah, well, then you not only got your patient out of your clinic, but you didn't help him also. So it's important to tell the patient how long will it take and what, what does his exercise uh, regime uh, looks like. Also, 
are there any things the patient can do at home? Uh, what, 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 what can I do at home? What can I do f- besides being in the clinic here? And that's also something I, I address. Uh, I explain them the, the home exercises they need to do. I tell them and I, I sometimes shock, shock them by saying, okay, you, now you need to do your exercise each day, uh, like two times each day. And then they're like, oh, but my, my previous physio said I just had to do my exercises twice a week for five minutes. Uh, you tell me uh, two times a day and I have to train like 15 minutes. That's about a half an hour a day. And then they're a little bit shocked. And I always wonder why that, why that is. It's, it's just 15, it's a half an hour for their problem each day. It's, it's nothing, I think, but it appears to be a, a shocking for some, some patients. It's a whole anyway. Netflix show. You can't do that, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are there any things a patient can do at home? That's a, a question I answer. And then are there any consequences for my work or my hobbies? There's also one I, I sometimes address. Some will ask you, some won't, but can I, can I still go swimming? Can I still do my job? And, and I try to answer that question. So that's just a, a short but important start with educating your patient. So I, I believe, I really believe this short but important part of education is, is mandatory. It's really mandatory. Yeah. It can also be important, for instance, to counter wrong illness beliefs if the patient still when you go into google and you see uh, shoulder impeachment syndrome you see all the pictures of uh, of supraspinatus cracking and and exploding between the the acromion and the humeral head so they think if i move my arm then uh, i will uh, get my tendons uh, encroached so i will not do that because i will get an impingement so you need to uh, counter illness beliefs there like this impingement mechanism and these things are so important, I, I think, to by explaining also, I think you, you build a good patient-therapist relationship. That's really important that they make sure that they will not quit their exercises regime too quickly. Yeah? They, it builds confidence for the patient. So, that, so that's really my first goal. And then next, I will start with planning uh, the first exercises mainly, uh, depending on the pain pattern of the patient. This is sort of yeah, screening, searching towards the main, most painful uh, movement pattern, as I explained uh, previously because that will be the basis for the exercises i will then downsize these painful movements and create exercises that will load the injured tissue but without creating too much uh, reaction of the of the tissues and after uh, loading this all is uh, dependent on the tissue irritability as a concept that uh, comes from fr- uh, frozen shoulders mainly but it's an important uh, part is tissue irritability and then when performing the first exercises, first physical therapy uh, sessions, I also take advantage of, of the patient being in the clinic to explain benefits of general fitness. That may be bizarre, I don't know, but I think it's, it's really important then to take advantage of that moment of the patient being in a clinic to tell them, okay, it's, it, encourage them to start or restart things they like to do, like running, cycling, walking, swimming, whatever as long as they like it. This morning I had a patient in the clinic, I think she was 23 years old. Uh, she was uh, she had athletics uh, uh, running all, the, all her life, but now she had shoulder pain and she stopped and she felt, felt miserable. And I asked her, why, why, why did you stop running? I said, oh, well, if I run, I sometimes have a, a sore shoulder and that's why I stopped running. And well, that's one of the first thing I advised her is to, re, to restart running, uh, maybe from a, a basic level again, like some sort of start to run again, but just uh, you can do that. And it was apparently her, her, she got a big smile on her face, just saying, okay, I can, I can restart my hobby. Really, I can restart uh, running was uh, the best Christmas gift I gave her, I think, for something like that. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, and, but it's not only for the motivation, it's also for the metabolic uh, fa- uh, effect of running. It is exercise induced hypoalgesia is a factor that's important. It's a, it's a really um, important thing, I, I think. So and together with the exercise, I uh, sometimes use manual mobilizations. I must admit that I use this often just to get a stronger bond with my patients. I don't know if that makes sense, but so mainly during my first therapy sessions, after a while, these sessions are reduced and uh, the impact of exercises are increased. But I use them. I think the, the importance of manual therapy is mainly when there is a strong restriction in, uh, in range of motion and you, uh, you can do that together with your active exercises because I still believe that with active exercises, you can, you can even, evenly get range of motion better than with passive. But you can also, when the patient's in the clinic, um, most of the patient just comes one, once a week or once in two weeks in the clinic for rotator cuff related shoulder pain. I am, um, especially in the beginning, I sometimes start with short mobilization session, but 
it's uh, it's not that much and it's a way to ask the patient how's how is he going it's just the first uh, some sort of anamnesis again uh, just uh, talking with the patient and i use this mobilizations for that and then he goes uh, training ah, fantastic i find that myself as well i try to limit the amount of hands-on time that i'd mm. have with a patient the the longer that they're with me yeah in the first couple sessions you know it gives it that analgesic effect that, uh, and a little bit in their head that oh okay it doesn't hurt that bad now i, I mm. can try the exercises i can do it they get that positive boost all of a sudden for that first session second session mm. and then i try as quick as i can to get them as active as i can themselves so that we don't build in that reliance and if they have a setback i do my utmost to not have to get hands on so that the patient doesn't get that belief in their head mm. that oh there's pain i need to go see them um no they for for me what i like to try to have with my patients is that they have this sort of manual for themselves of oh okay this hurts these are the steps that i can take to to try and improve things and then if that doesn't work yeah go for a check again and i also just going back a little bit what you said there with regards to the patient education that's so important it's i, I think just from my questioning it's something that can sometimes be forgotten and it's great that you highlighted that because i jump straight to what exercises do you give and mm, no no, mm. no pull back first and it's something that a previous guest mentioned as well explain the why and they will comply mm. if you mm. explain what's going on you get that compliance with them like you said that therapeutic alliance is going to be mm, better exactly. as well didn't mean to rhyme it but it did hey hey um, yeah. <laughs> and again using that hands-on time as well to just increase that bond with the patient and, and get that buy-in such valuable tips and tools for for those listening that fantastic you mentioned there the hands-on techniques would be mobilizations what type of mobilizations are you utilizing well it depends a bit on the the restriction but most of the rotator cuff related shoulder pain patients are not that the, are not the biggest restricted shoulders um, they sometimes have a more internal rotation uh, deficit but i see that a lot of them have uh, increased external rotation so in case there is not really a reduced total range of motion then i don't focus on that uh, only when it's really reduced in absence of of uh, uh, increased external rotation i, I sometimes focus on the on internal rotation uh, range of motion mobilizations but for the rest it's actually uh, not, nothing more than uh, going uh, getting the, your hands on the shoulder and uh, moving towards abduction with a, with some a little bit inferior translation of the humeral head but actually it's it's nothing big it, it's a way of uh, talking with the patient getting ex actually it's more like a, i see it as an, an extra educational part uh, in which you can explain things uh, in which you can uh, give them new tips and tricks and then you stop with your uh, with your training. You've increased the self-efficacy a little bit, and uh, it's indeed like you say. You don't want the patient to be dependent on uh, on you. That's a tricky a tricky part there. But I don't have the feeling that the the, the five or ten minutes of manual mobilizations get the patient dependent on uh, on, on therapy. Actually, um, I don't have the feeling that's uh, that's the, the case. Grant, and do you ever use any adjuncts like uh, shockwave, tens, complex, dry needle, and anything like that at all? No, that's that's too expensive for me. Uh, I don't have all this equipment. <laughs> no, we we do have them in the in the practice, and then some colleagues uh, sometimes use them. But actually, I I don't. I've I haven't had maybe these type of patients in which it's uh, I felt that needed. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I have the feeling that the exercises itself has it creates it the window of opportunity for themselves. So the exercises reduce pain in which they can use do more exercises. It maybe sound a bit bizarre, but I don't have the feeling I need to use other tools for that, but still it depends a little bit on what you're used to. I'm, I'm not a trained dry needler, for instance, and I don't know how that works, so I'm not doing that, of course. Uh, so if someone can, can use that and, and thinks, well, okay, this gives me a window of opportunity for doing other stuff, I, I will not discourage them. But for me personally, I've, I don't use uh, extra things, no. We've spoken about exercises getting people going. How do you decide when it's time to progress their program? What are the milestones or yeah. key points that you use in their trajectory that you think, okay, cool, now we can go on, or okay, yeah. maybe not? It's subjective, and partially it's, it's it's difficult, but it is important to increase 
load capacity of the of your cuff. So um, when a patient tells you he or she is not really reacting anymore on exercises, I think it's time to increase increase the load, change the exercise, make it more challenging, fun, uh, change positions, whatever. I often refer to running training. So if you have sore legs for two days after training, yeah, that was too much. Eh? But if you feel nothing at all, uh, for instance, when you go up the stairs and you feel nothing at all after training, you probably did too few. So, or it was a recovery training. But anyway, I, 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 use, I use reaction at for intervention criteria oh. to progress or not. So if they don't have any reaction or the reaction is just, just an hour, two hours after intervention and they are uh, on the low irritability level, yeah, then I think you can increase yeah. P- purely based on the reaction of the patient. I mentioned it earlier. What is the kinetic chain in the shoulder and how important is it to train within the whole the kinetic chain? It's something we often hear about within the lower extremity. Yeah. What is it? What does it mean for the shoulder? Is it something related to that brain connection that you mentioned as well? The shoulder is just one joint within the chain of joints getting the hand where the brain wants it to be and that's actually the 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 summary so yes the whole upper extremity even in combination with the trunk and the lower limbs are important after a few therapy sessions when the patient understands his exercises is able to do his daily exercises exercise routines and understand reaction to an exercise it's often time to include more and more of the whole body, I think. I find it also a good time to keep challenging the patient, making sure that they don't get bored uh, by doing always the same exercise day in, day out. This kinetic chain can make the exercises really fun. Eh? You, can, you can use all this, all the equipment you have in your practice or even without any equipment, but challenging the whole body during their simple exercises and putting them on unstable bases or, or whatever challenges uh, the patient, extra challenges the patient then and it makes it really makes it extra fun uh, for the patient, extra motivated. And by the way, I, I I always do the patient's exercises together with the patient. So I'm I'm not just staring at him or her like you, like you're in a zoo, like you're looking at a at a monkey in the zoo. <laughs> Sometimes the patient has that has that feeling. He's doing his exercises and he's just looking at them. Uh, but I have the impression that if you just join the patient with doing the exercises, that this way of working gets the patient more excited about about the exercises and more motivated and and it also feels less awkward for the for the patient of course mm. because i'm I, yeah i have the advantage I'm, I'm only half a day in the clinic so it's easy for me to do all the exercises with the patient but i can imagine if you're every day in the clinic it can be exhausting yeah. uh but but still it's still choose your patients then i would say uh, pick your moments uh pick the days and uh, choose the patients in which you think well this might give them an extra impulse and uh, join them with the with doing the exercises i think yeah okay great and are there any big differences in the different areas of the shoulder complex and the treatment we should use so if you're mm-hmm. suspecting someone with an ac joint versus a glenohumeral or if you're suspecting someone with a capsular issue then someone who may have some connected chain issues with the scapula or something it's also a very interesting question and yeah um also not not easily answered i think it might sound like more a movement philosopher now but i i believe we we should st- we should start with the end what does the patient need to be able to do uh, uh, what he or she wants to do so if we look at that if we look at the end in most cases the patient needs to perform a muscular contractions through a certain range of motion you can make it very complicated if you like but at the end that what's important in the clinic building building capacity for moving the shoulder joint through a certain range of movement. So that's, that's the basis for all uh, participation level uh, uh, issues for the patient. So, and this is irrelevant of the type of shoulder pathology in some way. So in basis, exercises are, in, in my opinion, is the most often the core of your intervention. However, each patient is different, of course. Each exercise is different. Each shoulder problem is different. And let's not forget the brain, which I mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning. So each intervention will be different, but still actively moving the arm through range will be the basis of all interventions. But of course, together with this uh, tissue irritability, which guides the intensity of an exercise or manual therapy, the type of impairments can play a role. And of course, the pathoanatomical diagnosis, of course, uh, uh, whether or not a structure was repaired operatively, of course, it's a, that will guide timing, timing of your loading, but it's not that you will not load. It's another timing. At the end, you will always load them.
I suppose it's probably something I should have asked earlier on within the chat, but let's say um, we don't really say subacromial pain syndrome now anymore, right? It's more rotator cuff uh, related pain. You mentioned as well that there used to be the thought of the decreased space within the subacromial space was the reasoning, the rationale behind the issues. What is the reasoning now? What is it that's changed? And what is it that if we're talking to our patients and if we're explaining this to our patients, what what should we tell them? How should we define what's going on for them? The, the rationale has changed from, let's say, a more extrinsic cause of their shoulder pain, like it's due to uh, supracromial space uh, reduction or due to a shortness of your pec minor or, or whatever, um, more going towards an intrinsic cause of their pain, like your, the, your, your pain rises from your tendons or, or actually not from the tendons, it's from the brain, but it's, it's, it arises from the cuff and you have a disbalance between your loading and your uh, uh, capacity. And uh, so that's actually the, the, the main focus, I think, about your explanation is about um, explaining uh, that the pain arises from the cuff while, while loading in the absence of, a, of a, another uh, uh, restricting pathology. What do you think is it about your approach to rehab that really separates out what you do from our other colleagues in the field? What is it about your approach mm. do you think that's the, yeah, able to give you these beneficial results with your patients? And I, I'm not sure whether it's so different with other therapists in the field, but in simplifying your rehabilitation, which is not the same as making it simplistic, but in simplifying rehabilitation, I think your patient will be more involved in the rehab process. Your patient will understand what's necessary to get there, and this will massively improve compliance of, uh, to exercises. This will improve motivation. This will give space for you as a therapist to focus on building a good relationship with the patient, getting, getting him, or, him or her motivated, building a good exercise routine uh, personalized to the patient's capacity and interests. And um, you, have, uh, you have time for that and you can, you can really focus on that. So there are so many advantages, I think, to it then. And, and in the absence of any proof that the complex approach gives you better outcome, I really think we should, we should choose that path. It gives you time to focus on the thing that, in my opinion, really matters, and that's the, uh, getting the patient motivated to do their uh, exercise regimes and, and getting a more healthier lifestyle also, if, if possible. What would be your top three tips for anyone who's getting into shoulder rehabilitation or wants to refine, refine their skills with it? Make it complex, but then return to the basics. Eh? Understand the shoulder. Understand, I think that's the main thing. Understand the shoulder and look at it as, a, as, as like your favorite team sport. Eh? If one player makes a, a goal, like in, in, in soccer, if it's, it's not the keeper to blame at, eh, at the end. Then why do we used to, we're used to look at the shoulder that way? So it's never one structure alone. It's a, it's a team. So try to understand the team as a whole and make the shoulder better as you would make a team better. Uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's the whole team. There are defenders, the attackers, the, the keeper, even the trainer by the side, which is maybe your brain then. Uh, it's the whole team uh, that needs to function well and, and don't stare at one, one player at all. Uh, so, so that's maybe the, the, my, my main message here. Yeah. I absolutely love that. And I hope you know I'm going to steal that and use that in clinics so much. <laughs> yeah. that's fantastic. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And are there any particular learning moments that have happened for you? You've had a you've had a long career. You've also had your masters and everything. You've been working in clinic from from the very start up until now. You must have some particular learning moments that something happens and maybe didn't go the way you quite wanted and after that something mm. twigged for you is there something a little gem that you can share with the listeners yeah well, I may I had a long career but not I'm not that old yet I'm 41 <laughs> <laughs> so there, sorry uh, that may have come out a little be, bit uh... be longer. <laughs> <laughs> no well it's true I've, I've had a lot of learning moments and um, um, maybe it's not it's, it's not about a shoulder problem I, I remember actually it's uh, um, I, I remember low back pain patient. I, I believe I was I was 23, recently graduated, and I had learned that chronic low back pain had a large psychosocial component in classes, and 
So I, I had this patient um, in, in the Netherlands, I believe I was uh, uh, working then, and I started to explain the functioning of the brain during uh, her first visit. But I, I wasn't really skilled to, to, to do pain education or, or I wasn't really skilled in the social, in the social aspect and getting the note, knowing the patient better at all. So, but what I, I didn't know was that the, the patient needs to be ready for, for this type of explanation. And, that, and also the way you, you do so is very important. So, so again, I, I explained the role of the, of the brain to the patient and guess what? She never came to her next appointment. So I'll never forget that. And you need to, you need to bind with your patient somehow in order to, to get through some barriers sometimes. And that's really some, a lesson I learned that. So yeah, a- anyway, I, I learn every time in, I'm in the clinic, you learn different pain patterns. You learn about different ways patients cope with their problem. You learn about different uh, ways patients report their pain. Uh, a six on 10 is not the same in every patient. It's uh, at all. Eh? And I also learned that making mistakes is okay. Eh? It's the best way to learn. So not doing anything, not, not daring to choose a certain intervention or, or load is worse, I think. So uh, you will make mistakes, but it's, but it's okay. Yeah. Okay. And have you any particular reading recommendations? Reading recommendations. Oh, uh, well, I have a few uh, papers on, um, uh, I, have, I, I did one with, 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 with Jeremy Lewis, uh, a few two years ago on the update of systematic reviews uh, examining the effectiveness of conservative physical therapy interventions for supracromial shoulder pain 2020 in the uh, in journal of orthopedic sports physical therapy which is an overview of uh, cuff rehabilitation uh, evidence so together with one of his uh, of, of jeremy's papers in 2016 a rotator cuff related shoulder pain assessment management and certainties also a good one uh, well there are several uh, several but uh, if you want just one or two papers uh, to get an overview of uh, of cuff problems, I think you can get very far with uh, with this uh, paper. Okay, so it's a uh, it's one by Peters uh, Peters in uh, two twenty twenty, and the other one is by Lewis uh, Jeremy Lewis in twenty sixteen. Uh, yeah, okay. fantastic. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're also the man behind the physio tutors course uh, for the shoulder, uh, for separating fact from fiction. Can you maybe talk to the listeners a little bit about that? Uh, and uh, yeah, for those that are interested, just so they can get a little bit of an overview about what they can expect from the course. Well, the course is, uh, it, I, I didn't choose a certain concept to follow in the course. It's, uh, it's really translating current evidence to, uh, to clinical practice. And I just start with the, with the beginning, with the assessment, uh, how, what, what does a rotator cuff related pain patient look like and what is it not? What should your education uh, look like? What's, uh, what's the tenderness problem really from a, a histological point of view? And then go from assessment towards what's the evidence now, 2021, what's the evidence in rotator cuff related shoulder pain? What, what should we do? Should we uh, use some sort of tool exercise? Uh, manual therapy, whatever, what's the, the, the biggest evidence at the moment, translating that to uh, the, the final parts of the course is really focusing on that rehabilitation strategy, like manual therapy and exercise therapy. I remember we did, we did a few days of filming in, uh, in, in, in physio, with physio tutors, just getting lots of exercises in there, which you can pick from and, and use as some sort of inspiration with your patients to to train with and also a part on the scapular of course uh, it's my phd i had to put a, a chapter on the scapular in there separate the facts from fiction there because that's a really a, a important thing and it, it's gone through a whole evolution but uh, we're maybe getting there with the scapula so uh, that's also an, uh, a thing that you can expect in the in the course yeah but expect it to be uh, from research perspective going really to the clinic uh, trying to make it as practical as possible so you can uh, use it the day afterwards uh, in your clinic with your uh, shoulder pain patients and for anyone listening as well there is also a little 50 euro discount code there as well uh, rcrsp50 so uh, that's rcrsp50 um, for anyone listening, you can pop that in on the Physio Tutors website when you get in the course, and that will get you a little bit of discount on there as well. Look, where can people find you if they've got any other additional questions or anything? Well, they can always uh, email me uh, at uh, philip 
dot streff. I was thinking about my own email address. Sorry, <laughs> Philip dot streff at the uantwerp dot be. I'm not. I'm not super active on social media. I'm, I am on Instagram and Twitter, but mainly on Twitter. Maybe I try to tweet some shoulder related topics there. So that's uh, always uh, an, an option, and they can always uh, email me, of course. Yeah. Okay. And what's your Twitter and Insta? Uh, just my name. Just okay. my name uh, on Twitter, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, my name with a, a, a PT after it in, on Instagram. I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll uh, find you, Philip. Thank you very, very much for being able to spend some time with us and have a chat with us. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's really informative. And I hope everyone listening enjoys it as much as I did uh, recording it with you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gents, thanks again for listening in, and we'll catch you next time. As always. Wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time, peace.